I'm Carl Peterson from the Laboratory of Sensory Processing at the Brain Mind Institute of the EPFL. My laboratory is interested in obtaining a causal and mechanistic understanding of how sensory perception and associative learning occur at the level of individual neurons and their synaptic interactions. Individual neurons of the neocortex receive both excitatory glutamatergic input and inhibitory GABAergic input, and the neuronal computation occurs through the integration of these two signals. Here you can see a membrane potential recording from a layer 2 free pyramidal neuron in an awake behaving mouse. You can see large amplitude membrane potential fluctuations, and if you block GABAergic inhibition by drug application, action potential firing rates go up. Clearly, GABA has an inhibitory action in the brain, and in order to understand how this GABAergic inhibition comes about, we clearly need to be able to record the activity of the GABAergic neurons. GABAergic neurons form a sparse population of neocortical neurons, and in order to visualize them, we need to have them specifically labeled. Here you can see a brain slice where we've labeled all the cells with DAPI, that's the blue color. In red, you see all the neurons labeled with new N. And in green, you see the GFP labeled neurons, which are GABAergic, in a mouse developed by Tamamaki et al. in 2003, where they knock in GFP into the GAD67 gene locus. I'm Luc Jante, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Laboratory of Sensory Processing, working with Carl Peterson on inhibitory neurons in the brain. And using this GAT67 mouse that Carl just spoke about, combined with two photon imaging, we performed whole cell recordings of GABAergic neurons in the brains of awake animals. In the following video, we are looking into the brain, focusing in and out at a depth of around 200 microns. You can see the recording electrodes filled with a red dye Alexan 594 and the two neurons that were recorded from simultaneously, in this instance, two interneurons that appear yellow with a combination of the green fluorescent protein and the red dye filling the cells. The collected data allowed us to build a clearer picture of the electrical activity of diverse brain cells in the neocortex of awake mice. When the mouse is in quiet wakefulness, both excitatory cells and the two classes of interneurons we characterized display prominent 2 to 3 hertz slow oscillations. However, interneurons spontaneously fire action potentials at much higher rates than pyramidal cells, and their resting membrane potentials are more depolarized. But how synchronized are the action potentials between various neurons? Local interneurons either contribute to the slow oscillations by firing out of sync with excited neurons, as you can see on the left, or they follow them and dampen their excitation, as you can see on the right. We perform dual whole cell recordings between pairs of various combinations of excitatory and inhibitory cells. And here is shown a dual recording between a pyramidal cell and a GABAergic fast spiking cell. In all cases, we found a high level of correlation of the subthreshold membrane activity in quiet wakefulness. Since neurons only discharge when depolarized, the neuronal outputs of both pyramidal and interneurons are synchronized at the level of the slow wave frequency, i.e. they fire in phase. Finally, we examined the modulation between the two groups of interneurons during periods of active wakefulness, i.e when the mouse is engaged in active whisking. We observed a complete change in discharge rates between the two behavioral conditions and the two groups of GABAergic cells. On the left, the highly discharging fast spiking interneurons saw their firing rates decrease, while on the right, an increase was observed in non-fast spiking cells during active wakefulness. We're very excited about these first membrane potential recordings from GABAergic neurons in awake mice, uh, and in particular in seeing brain state dependent reorganization of the GABAergic networks. These changes might underlie the profound changes in sensory processing that we've seen in previous studies. Perhaps of equal importance, this study reveals the technical feasibility of obtaining targeted recordings from genetically labeled neurons, which we think will be of enormous importance for future studies of brain function.